too. The really good I, the really good news here is that you know for those of you who who uh, kind of think that we never get anything done, well we have a what Harvard Business School would call a case study in what happened and it all happened within the last year. It's a really success story and it points out the things that need to happen with respect to working with the media, working with the elected officials, and having the guts to persist. So. Without further ado, I'm going to ask Matt to speak first, and then Elsa, and then uh, I'll, I'll say a few words before we end. We want to leave a lot of time for uh, questions and answers. Matt, could you uh, hold forth? Yeah, sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and if there's anyone outside still, there's still a few more seats. Real good. Okay, great. Uh, well, thanks everyone for attending. Um, yeah, I had a, a experience. Uh, uh, both in Iraq and, and Afghanistan uh, with uh, drones to a degree, more with uh, the kill target, the kill capture campaign uh, in Afghanistan due to my nature with the State Department uh, because as a political officer with the State Department in my role um, in the province as a political officer for a province, my job was to make sure we weren't killing the wrong person for political reasons. Because very often, because our intelligence was so bad, we would kill the wrong person and then cause problems. So whether by dropping a bomb on them or sending a, 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 a commando team in, um, we would kill someone who was working with us or kill someone who was related to somebody who was working with us, or make enemies that we didn't meet, need to make. And so what they were having people like me do was try and vet the program to make sure that our killing was appropriate and politically correct. <laughs> okay, and that's pretty much as nonsensical and ridiculous as it sounds, right, in practice. Um, it also was, uh, about it also as ineffective. Uh, i give you a statistic. Uh, when I left uh, in Afghanistan, and, and this is not strictly limited to the drones, um, is, uh, this is a, a, an operational nature, not strategic. So in the sense that um, in Afghanistan, we are using drones, manned aircraft, as well as uh, the task force. So uh, the Delta Force commandos and the Navy SEAL commandos as well then too also the infantry units on the grounds would also participate in the kill capture, okay? So your, your, your basic infantry platoons and companies would also do these raids as well. And in my province, in the Zabo province, about the time we were leaving, we had roughly about 40 targets on our list, okay, of people in the province that we need to kill or capture. These are people that need to go away to make the province safer for us, for our Afghan allies, and for democracy and freedom to blossom, right? So at that point, this prov Zabo province was about the fifth most violent province in Afghanistan in terms of number of attacks a day, Okay, you know, in terms of the number of IDs that would go off or, or whatever metric you want to look at. Well, the task force comes in because only so many resources and they would move around the country and clear certain parts of the province. They would go through what's called the JPEL, the Joint Prioritized Effects List. Okay, and this was, they would clear sections of the country at a time. And it simply wasn't effective because they did come through and they cleared the list for that part of the country and they, they killed all 40 targets, I, or maybe they captured some, um, but primarily killed most of them. And, uh, you know, but four or five months after, all 40 of those targets were, all 40 of those people, and probably, and many of their family members were also killed, Zabal was still the fifth most violent province in the country. Had no effect. I mean, so not only was this morally abysmal, not only was it completely horrible what we were doing, not only was it counterproductive because it was turning the people against us, was it was making enemies out of the people. They already were our enemies anyway, so it didn't really matter in that sense. But like, not only was it counterproductive, that, but also it was ineffective. It was just, just didn't work because it just did, did not work. But the way 
how we assemble this information was, as Ray was saying, so much of it was driven by signals intelligence. So much of it was driven by the fact that on a piece of paper was a phone number, and that phone number was tied to the idea that the corresponding person that was associated with the phone number was an IED maker, roadside bomb maker, or somebody who delivered parts that would make up a roadside bomb to, you know, or somebody who provided financing that would make up a roadside bomb, or somebody who did propaganda. We were very interested in killing people who did propaganda and communications. Actually, at one point, we were going to do a big campaign in Jalalabad. We never did this campaign for a variety of reasons, but the very first people that we were going to kill and capture were the Taliban communications people. The very first people we were going to go after were the communications people, okay? Because we wanted to make sure they didn't get their message out about what was happening. So, um, but, so but this is all tied to cell phone numbers. No idea what names were. No idea what they look like. No idea where they may live. No idea even what village they were in. All idea of basically on a phone number. And that's what the majority of the targets were based off of. And some of them were based off of human intelligence. And the human intelligence was even worse than the signals intelligence. The, sig the human intelligence was primarily based off of paid informants. And there are a couple ways that human intelligence could work its way up. Some of the human intelligence was from the ground units in the area. And this could be generally more reliable because the ground units, the American ground units, lived in the area, right? They were there for a year. And so at least they were there in the area and they knew the people, they knew the villages, they knew the area, they knew the terrain, they knew the roads at least. They, 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 they had some sense of what was occurring there and they couldn't be so easily fooled. They weren't so ignorant, okay? They had some idea of what was occurring there. Not a great idea, not a good idea, but they had some idea, and they had some ability to check facts. For instance, I one time received a email from the Defense Intelligence Agency in Washington, D.C., saying, are there any Uzbeks living in this village in northwest Zabal? <coughs> Bless you. We have, this, we have this query about this. And I said, there's no way there are Uzbeks living there. Everyone here is Pashtun. He's like, you please check. I said, okay. I went across the street and I went and met with the deputy governor. I said, are there any Uzbeks living up here? They said, he said, no. And then I went back and I said to the DIA, I said, uh, no, there's not. They then said, the DIA said, well, we were told there are. And I said, well, I'll check again with another person I know. I then went and I spoke to the guy, the intelligence chief in the province. Are there any Uzbeks here? He said, no, and he looked at me like I had seven heads on my shoulder, like I was just a complete fool for even asking that question. And I went back. And the response I got back from the guy at DIA in Washington, D.C., who had probably never even left the United States, was, thank you for your response. And I said, these guys looked at me like I was crazy. There are no Uzbeks up there. The response I got back was, thank you, but we're going to go with the information we have here. And that information is used for targeting purposes that would feed into these task force raids that are used by the SEALs and Delta commandos to kick in doors. And the idea in this sense was that it was, if anyone's ever heard of the IMU, the Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan, which was this shadowy group. Have you heard of IMU, Greg? This no. shadowy group that probably is composed of like, I don't know, all of like 62 guys probably totally. <laughs> but it's this great movement that supposedly is going to, you know, but this is a type of stuff that how the human was done. So for a lot of these movements, including the CIA, had the same experiences in Iraq dealing with the CIA. Myself and my Foreign Service counterpart in Iraq, my first time in Iraq in Tikrit, we were both United States government officials. And we would be in meetings, and then we'd see CIA readouts, or we'd hear information from the CIA from what happened in those meetings. We'd go and talk to the CIA liaison, say that's not what occurred in those meetings. 
And the response would be, thank you, but we're going to go with our sources. So the CIA would say, we're not going to listen to what two United States government officers are going to say. We're going to go with what our paid Iraqi informants are telling us. And this is how the information was built up. And this is how the human would be developed that would be used to send the commandos to raid buildings and homes and villages or drop bombs or shoot missiles. And this is how you get to the point where you hear these statistics that have been reported ad nauseum, as you most likely know, um, that 50 to 75 percent of those that we have detained are uh, released very quickly because there's absolutely nothing to do with the insurgency. But once they're released, then they have more interest in the insurgency, of course. But um, that gives you an idea of how um, the intelligence is built and why so many people, so many people are killed. So many innocent people are killed. I mean, we see from um, the drone documents that were, in the drone papers that were leaked to The Intercept a few years ago, you know, the, the Department of Defense's own assessments of the number of civilians who were killed is upwards of 90% of the drone strikes. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, the number of civilians that we killed to get one named target, you know, I think it's 28, I believe, is that, that, that the right number, Elsa? It's 28 civilians we kill for each named target. Yeah, that's what you Reprieve know? said, yeah, yeah. and the and drone paper said at least 90%. Uh, at least 90%, like and yeah. most of the time, if you look at, like, when we've killed the HVTs, the high value targets, as we call them, the big names, many, many times, we know we've killed them because Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State announces it themselves. We don't even know we've killed them. We've killed them by accident. We got lucky. So um, let alone some of the tactics we've, we've used, such as striking first responders and everything. But um, yeah, so I just wanted to give you that was how we operated. So, but. I think that's a good question. Um, yeah, but yeah, I got questions lined up. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you do? <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to interject here. Uh, when I was in the Army, it was uh, capture or kill. Now it's the other way around, right? You, you kill or capture. Kill, capture, yeah. and, and um, yeah, I mean, they yeah. would, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, they captured a lot. I mean, we had a lot of detainees. Um, and, and, but, uh, yeah. and you're saying that most of those uh, checked out as non, non-belligerents. Uh, yeah. And then there's a story about, you know, if- uh, 50 to 75%. If you, if you kill somebody uh, and posthumously you find something on them uh, to identify them as, a, as an insurgent, then you can add to your insurgent list, but otherwise you don't. Yeah. Well, not only that. I mean, the other side of the suit. Once you're detained, and in just to, and going fighting into Elsa's time here, but once you, you're detained them, and there was a United Nations report that came out in April. So the ones that we don't even re- that aren't even released right away that are turned over to the Afghan authorities. This is getting outside the drone lane, but just to heighten the human rights nightmare even more. Once they're turned over to the Afghan security forces, the United Nations reported that detainees in Afghan security force uh, possession, the rates of torture are anywhere from 25 to 60 percent, depending upon which security force is holding them. So if they go into detention, they are likely or possibly to likely being tortured. So I mean, this is just a, uh, this is just such a uh, the, the, the atrocities that are being committed here. The human rights nightmare that this is is just mm-hmm. yeah yeah. But uh, the question I had was uh, <coughs> all right. The drone started under the Bush administration. Speak loud. The drone started under the Bush administration. Okay, and back then. Uh, there weren't that many strikes with drones compared to what's happening now. Now, with the strikes with the drones under the administration there, were the statistics basically the same as now, or did, it, or did something change 
to go about how we identify the targets. So I think identifying the targets that are, from what I understood under the Bush administration was basically more of a, you know, special ops saying, okay, here's our, here's our target right here and calling in the drone strike and making sure everything was safe so they minimized uh, civilian casualties. Um, what has changed since then, or am I just totally off track? Well, I mean, so you have the, the drone strikes and the fixed uh, and the manned aircraft strikes, the airstrikes that are occurring outside of, say, Afghanistan, the ones that are occurring, say, in Yemen and Somalia, okay? And that target is done either by human intelligence or signals intelligence. Um, that, that is even more suspect because we don't even have the ground units there to that can even vet any type of information. And there's no effort to try and de-conflict or do even a minimal due process on this. And so, so the case in my case, when I was there in Afghanistan in 2009, we were trying to attempt to, we, we were trying to attempt for our, our own purposes, not, be, we, weren't, we weren't trying to, to, to figure out if we were killing the right people for humanitarian reasons or because it was more correct, we were doing it because we were trying to make, make ourselves more efficient, right? Because we were trying to, to win the war, right? But so in, in the nations, uh, so in like Libya or Somalia, uh, Syria, those places, the airstrikes um, are being done, the targeting, that information is being collected via human sources that we're paying or recruiting through some means or by signals intelligence. Um, but under the Bush administration, when the, the strikes were primarily only in Iraq and Afghanistan, yeah, you had a variety of, of methods, but it was about in 2006 or so when the signals intelligence really picked up and when they really started using uh, the cell phones. Um, and it was about 2007 when they really, um, and then Bob wrote, wrote about this quite a bit, yeah. So basically yeah. they don't care if they're, if, what, what the, with 28 casualties per one insurgent no. kill. And at this point, they just don't care. No, they don't. I mean, and, I mean, one of the most horrible things they were doing was the thing that really affected me is uh, when we were going after first responders and funerals. We claim we no longer do that, but there's a period of time under the Obama administration that we were targeting in Pakistan uh, I'm not sure if in other countries, but in Pakistan, we would hit a car or a house with a, with a drone strike. And then when the victims of that strike were being buried, we would then hit the funeral. The idea being that his friends who were also part of the insurgency or part of the terrorist group were gonna show up. Or when the first responders would show up, we would hit the first responders. Um, which is, I can't think of anything more sickening, but that's what the United States of America under President Obama was doing. They claim they no longer do that. I don't know. I mean, they've gone into such a level of secrecy with their actions now, and they're doing it on such a, 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 a basis. Uh, you know, a, 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 you know, Donald Trump under the Trump administration, they've, they've heightened a number of drone strikes. You know doubled basically, uh, you know, that, uh, and I don't see, I, I just don't see, and particularly too with the way that these generals are, the way they've spoken about the conflicts in Syria and Iraq, the conflicts they're actually talking about, the language they use, the way they've spoken openly about the airstrikes in Mosul and Raqqa. Uh, the disdain they've shown for the civilians who've been killed there, um, I can't imagine that they would have any interest in speaking the truth about what they're doing in Pakistan or Somalia or Libya or anywhere else. And they're not speaking about those places, so we have no idea whether or not they're still doing these types of, of strikes. Yeah. Thanks so yeah. much, Matt. Yeah. 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 Uh, now, from a pretty depressing uh, <laughs> uh, okay. uh, unless you're a mad dog or something. Uh, now we'll go to Elsa and she's got some relatively upbeat stuff to tell us which is real and which should give us all that's right kind of hope that we can uh, go go forth and do likewise well I have I have this little uh, 
PowerPoint that they put together, and we weren't sure from day to day whether we would have, or moment to moment would have it, but kindly, Michael's put it here. I'm gonna be moving up here, but I wanna say a few words, since we only did photos of others in the room here. Les Contreras is in one of the photos from this. You know? <laughs> she played a significant role also in this little victory we had. Mattel explained. Daniel, so, do you want to turn the lights so down? So those, uh, those who have not yet gotten one of these, because when people were waiting here, I passed it out, and that's what my first slide starts with. But the, I want to just putting it in a nutshell how we should think about it. Uh, today, it was spoken about that uh, we have to look at stopping atomic war internationally, and we have that good news. Some of you were at, at that session, perhaps the second plenary. We have the good news, we see how other nations are moving and closing in, even though the UN doesn't have the authority to actually demand that the US stop. They're creating a huge moral climate. And the other news I want to say is that Europe, and particularly Germany, have never accepted the theory of the war on terror. Even Great Britain has said we only want to strike in where there's a UN mandated war, Afghanistan, which we also don't like what they're doing there, of course. But all of these other things are considered illegal in Europe, and particularly in Germany, which took what happened in World War II extremely seriously, which took the Nuremberg principles seriously, which has spent seven decades trying to deal with their history. The first two decades was a lot of denial. Then there was, a, in the 60s movement, a lot of uh, going after Nazis who were still in positions as judges or professors. Then there was a whole period, I'm half German, that's one reason I can get along there somewhat, um, uh, but uh, my father came here in 39 to the US and left Germany in 38. But, um, they, they take this very seriously in their own families, as I and others did, and, and researching the war crimes out of their families. It still took until 2002 before they pardoned those who had deserted from the Wehrmacht, from the, the Nazi military, and it took until 2007 that they pardoned and rehabilitated, mostly post-humanly, human was post, Humously, right. Uh, I'm sorry, I was getting in my German head. And um, the posthumously, those who had been considered traitors. So when we, so I, I want to also say that um, when it was announced in 2012 by the German Defense Ministry that they wanted to have armed drones for the German military. There was an uproar even in the leading press, uh, such as the Süddeutsche, based upon the protests that had happened here and in, in the US. The critical voices here about drone warfare, the total, all the things that Lance Vitellius about it was pretty well known already. Uh, the Al-Awaki uh, Al case had already uh, been in, in, uh, started. Uh, the, uh, there was also the Living Under Drone study had already been done, uh, Stanford NYU study. And so there was already criticism. And uh, then uh, there has been, and that's going to be a lot of my presentation, active intervention <coughs> by US peace activists, uh, particularly Code Pink, of which I'm a member, but also others, uh, to, to bring this criticism further along both directly into working together with the German peace movement, but also as early as 2013 with Medea Benjamin's visit to Germany, her book was published in, uh, in, on drone warfare in German in 2013 because of the public interest there, uh, that, that we already started lobbying. I hosted her visit or organized, and we already were talking with all, trying to talk with all of the parties in the German Bundestag about this and delivering a letter to Angela Merkel and so forth. And so this has gone on and it's been, uh, we'll see a few of the things in the presentation. Um, and this has played a huge role even in this last victory. The victory is that after, since 2012, when they said they wanted these drones and they would come in a few months, 
They still don't have their armed drones in Germany. Uh, and they and we won uh, uh, in this last June, you know, they were going to have them and it seemed like all of the, the two biggest parties, the Social Democratic Party and the uh, CDU were gonna back it uh, to get in fact, because they don't want to do it like the U.S. and even criticism of the U.S. They wanted Israeli drones, a little more independent of the U.S. But uh, and also on the other hand, on the negative side, because Israel would provide more of the technology to Germany and Europe to build their own European armed drone, which they want to do by 2025. So. Uh, Basically, uh, the fact is, at the last moment, and due to a lot of also U.S. lobbying, even the film uh, National Bird played a role in this. You know, the different Lisa Ling was over, different whistleblowers who've been before, uh, most important, Brandon Bryan. This all was used, and even people, Nick Modern, who's been mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, wrote uh, to all the members of the Social Democratic in the party in the Defense Committee and in the Budget Committee. And this was something I worked out with Nick and also Ed Kinane from, from Hancock. Personal letters. And this was all mounted in the last two months, you know, before they were going to make this decision, which is the end of the total, this whole government, because in September comes the elections. Well, the SPD came out, who's gone along, frankly, the whole time, uh, basically came out, but who was, who was against the drones in their 2013 election, they said, we don't want these drones because they are going to carry weapons. And uh, so they said that publicly. For those who didn't get, I just, uh, did I paste this out, those who didn't have it? Sorry. Okay. So now we'll go on to, so I've been doing this kind of work for a long time. It was uh, with the U.S., uh, we had two big bases then and w worked on papers, maybe you've heard of some of them up against the wall, uh, forward and where it's at and so forth. Some of you who know that stuff. Um, and, w and then I came back to Germany in the 90s and I started then working also on uh, the issue of des U.S. deserters and resistors, military resistors. And some of the parties in the Bundestag, such as the Left Party and the Green Party, were already open to that uh, discussion after 2003. So anyway, this is this news. Um, I don't know if you can see it very well, um, this, this PowerPoint as it is looking projected, but we'll see. Uh, anyway, that's just, uh, I've sent you the, given you the article, the full article. Um, the, um, some of you heard about Rammstein, but before Rammstein was the issue whether they, Germany would have these armed drones at all. And all the things that Matt is saying is in the German press, and uh, very often uh, activist things are being translated in German also over there. Let's see. So um, I'll go on to the next one. It's saying that this was our uh, demonstration at the, uh, on the 21st of June, um, uh, when, and we were uh, in front of the Bundestag, uh, the drone movement or the network. We were presenting on behalf of the whole national uh, drone campaign network um, this uh, petition, uh, appeal no combat drones. That was uh, calls in the end to the, the German government to work to, uh, for, to, for an international ban of weaponized drones. It cites the reasons against it, all the things that have been said here before about targeting, about the civility, the, all of the casualties, who so they don't even know what they're doing. Uh, I would have printed some of this out if I had known the visual quality was not that good, but we go on. Interestingly Can we enough, the focus on that so at all maybe there, there's a way to do that. Yeah, Our does someone know how? Be moved closer to the front? No, no, that'll make the image small. Yeah. yeah. Do you know how to do that? Yeah. There you go. Oh, yeah. great. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Great. We're good. Yep. There you go. I'm a filmmaker, but I don't know projectors. <laughs> so, um, I should know focusing. So at that same rally, here spoke Karl Heinz Brunner of the SPT uh, Defense Committee, and he's the speaker uh, on, disar on the disarmament uh, committee for the for the subcommittee for the SPD, and um, he's someone uh, with whom, oh, while well, I started working at, or working, I was on a panel discussion with him the end of 2015, uh, when Code Pink came to Germany again in 2016, in April, and we did a tour on Rams about Ramstein and close Ramstein and all that, uh, 
we met with him. He made, you see here's Leslie Harris. <laughs> so we met with him. He set up a big meeting for us in the, in the German parliament uh, with, uh, with also a significant member of the Green Party, the guy with the white hair there, uh, um, Hans Christian Strubula. He's one of the major guys on the NSA uh, investigation committee. And uh, you see also uh, Anne Wright here, uh, second from the left, and um, Martha Hubert, and Toby Blumet, don't forget Toby before the Martha, and, uh, and also um, oh, what's Josie. Josie, right, uh -huh. Tell them and what also Carl Heinz Barbara, said. Uh, what? Tell them what Carl Heinz Luna said. Yeah, well, uh, you mean what he said in the, you mean in his speech there? Yeah. Yeah, oh, you mean another time. What he said when Ray was attended something that subsequently the Karl Heinz Brunner uh, organized on targeted killing, where he had also several military people there, other people from the Social Democratic Party, which is not exactly your most peace-loving party always. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and he said that he had learned publicly that he had learned from Code Pink uh, to take very seriously this issue of targeted killing. And when he spoke uh, on June, in June, uh, he said um, that he is uh, not only against having a weaponized drone, but he wants to work for an international ban of such weapons in the United Nations, okay? Uh, and uh, I thought, with all he said in that speech, which first of all, I didn't even know, I was asked to try to get him to come, and I didn't even know if he would come. But when he came, he gave an incredible speech. And then I thought, oh my goodness, he's probably going to be kind of an outsider in the Social Democratic Party after this, but no. And Ray and I have met with other high-level people uh, there, and they came out and backed him publicly in the leading media in Germany and said, we don't want drones with weapons, including the head of the, uh, the, the complete head, chair of the Defense Committee in the Bundestag, with whom Ray and I met. And he said, out before, they've always said, of course, we would never use them for extrajudicial killing. We'll never go anywhere where there's not a mandated war, mandated by the UN. Now they consider Syria to be mandated by, under the EU, that you have to help a member EU state. They're helping France after the uh, supposed, oh, I won't say supposed, but target, uh, terrorist thing that happened in Paris. And France said, oh, attack Syria. Um, but if it's not mandated, by some kind of law, they don't want to be involved. But um, for uh, Afghanistan, they were always saying, we need it for troop support. We need, and if we, we need better visuals, we need the newer drones, they only come with weaponizable, that's the Israeli and US drones, and we need them for that. And he said in, the, in this press things, you know what, helicopters are much better than drones for troop support. Uh, they make a lot of noise and sometimes scare the perpetrators away. <laughs> that, was, that was he said. So, but the thing is, we don't know. Uh, we're going to have a big struggle in the fall. That's why I, one of the reasons I'm with you that we're going to have to keep lobbying um, to keep this little victory that we have, or important victory, but it's not necessarily going to be uh, sustainable unless we keep up the pressure. Okay. So, oops, it's not showing anything here. Wait. Oh, a little video I wanted to show you. Yeah, if I can figure out how to click it from this position here. So grass, grassroots pressure can sometimes work and even bring miracles, right? Would you describe this as a miracle that the SPD would uh, turn around on this? Uh, no, <coughs> no. I, I would not. I'm going to tell you that there's a long history to it, and I'm going to tell you that there is substantial disagreement with U.S war on terror and U.S. drone policy throughout the European Union, and including in the NATO states. Uh, and that is, uh, on the other hand, uh, contradicted by their own greediness to get into the weapons business on all these things. And the second thing that's contradicted by is their fear of confronting the U.S. on this issue directly. So is, that, is that backed by the feelings of the people themselves? Absolutely. I mean, Germany is, uh, I don't know throughout Europe, I couldn't speak for every country, you know, but I, I know that uh, I've seen studies in Pew that show large numbers against targeted drone in most countries uh, besides Israel, 
Kenya and the US. I think the majorities are against that. Um, and, uh, but in the case of Germany, it's been a, a, a majority pacifist uh, country for, since really, it, it said after World War II, never again, and that's their position. But their position has been, we want to stay nice and moral and neat. We don't want to send the German troops and the German weaponized drones, but we don't want to necessarily confront the U.S. on this. You see, that's that's the issue, you know, that they have where they think it, it might be. But they don't have to have the drone themselves for that necessarily. It's, but here's a little example where we also took a code. This is taking a page from Code Pink, uh, something that I was also involved in with the pink scarf, protesting right in the German parliament when they were discussing doing armed drones. And we had, uh, you know, uh, uh, we were arrested and we had to, you know, uh, have a court case and so forth. We went nicely as the Germans do. <laughs> uh, but I'm saying that the SPD uh, was willing, and said the subject is whether they want to get weaponized drones for the military. Let me turn this to the next one. And so this is in German, but uh, that was, a, that was uh, they're still talking to us even if we're violating the law right in the Bundestag, actually a democratic discussion about it. They still will talk with us. Um, and this is a, uh, the only thing I have just in German. This is what they then voted on in 2000, with SPD for their, because the people are against it. That's why it's a good issue on the election campaign. That's why the SPD doesn't want to be supporting weaponized drones in the election campaign, because many people will vote for those that do, the left party and the green party, it, because they also oppose this in a large majority in Germany. But this happened in 2013, and they put on the, the, the there's a negotiation, which I'll explain to you of the, uh, uh, the German, you have to understand a little bit about the German political system to understand what this means. This other one, yeah, I should translate it right away. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit here. Okay, extrajudicial uh, 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 killings that are against, we, we categorically reject extrajudicial killings against international law with weaponized drones. Categorish. Uh, Categorish. And we, uh, there's another thing that's not in here, we will not uh, uh, acquire any such weapons without a full investigation of all the constitutional, international law, and ethical questions related to that. That never happened. That's one reason, that's one of the things SPD is arguing this never happened. Uh, these, uh, the way that the German and also European system works, it's important because I'm saying because it's important to know that when you're writing letters or that we help it, why is the SPD strategic? The SPD, you see the way it is in Germany, any party that has 5% of the vote is, it has a seat in the parliament. I personally think the Green Party here would have over 5% if people thought they would be, have a, seats from this. Um, and so at the end of an election, generally now, there's, nobody has a majority, and so they have to negotiate with each other. In this case, uh, the SPD, the big red one, the left party and the green, the, the furthest up there, the pink kind of, and the green party, with the opposition, they're against the drones anyway. Although the green party does go along with a lot of warlike things that the left party does not agree with. The SPD, the Social Democratic Party, was large and they allied with the CDU. And they did force on the CDU that statement that I just read to you. However, what they did in this last thing is they moved their votes over to the side with the green and the left, which they can do, and they could even form a government with the green and left party after the election. Or they might form another, uh, you know, and if they did that, it would be pretty sure that we would hold on to this victory. If they, however, go with the CDU again or something, we might not hold on to it unless we're pretty vigorous, okay? So um, just to show you another uh, example, uh, that demo was, inspired by Code Pink, the red hands were inspired by Code Pink, and the form of demo was, and here we have, uh, we had a Global Action Day then in October 2014, and uh, that slogan in English is, fly kites, not drones. <laughs> okay, so, and that was, uh, you know, you see the Palestinian flags, very unusual in Germany, uh, with the left party flags and all that, that the, the, the Palestinian movement in Berlin also made this an issue because of the Israeli drones. 
and uh, not that we knew that they do it. Then this was uh, very widely supported, about 120 actions, uh, very strongly in Germany, but other, also in other European countries, and many in the US. Nick Modern and I worked closely on that coordination, and we had, he helped set up a US, an English language website for this in addition to the German one. This was from the website that we had where people could post their actions. But uh, not posted was an action in Gaza also. Um, and then uh, it's be, this drone uh, struggle is not just in Germany. OK, I have to go quickly here. Uh, it's also been in, uh, in many countries, Great Britain, and also in, uh, for example, Italy, uh, Sicily. This is a 10,000 person demo. And th so in, in I have something I want to pass out to you, uh, which is the European, the, this big one here. Uh, no, that one here. Yeah, you can pass that out. This is something to take a look at uh, because it, this was passed by the European Parliament with well over 500 to 49 opponents. That means that it was supported across Europe and across all political parties to some degree. And it basically says that they want to oppose and ban the practice of extrajudicial targeted killings. And further down, they say that they want to commit to uh, uh, to assuring that where drones, where there are reasonable grounds for believing that an individual or entity in their jurisdiction may be, uh, may be connected to an unlawful targeted killing abroad, then they are to take legal uh, measures in, in accordance with their domestic and international legal obligations. That means, guys, they're actually recommended prosecuting the US and US people for doing this on that's actually for any in any European country. Now the, the, uh, this is working against the way NATO likes to uh, present drones when they say they want to buy some that it's for everything traffic watch uh, 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 help humanitarian help. There's a little war on terror up there up to the upper left <coughs> but that's sort of what the drones are supposed to be so we're working against that PR legally can yeah. they prosecute the military because when the military uh, has an installation overseas, that ground that the military is on belongs to the United States. No, that's not true. The German bases, the U.S. German bases, and this has been in many jurists, are under German legal uh, jurisdiction. And they actually have an obligation to prosecute. Um, so they, they so they, they, yes, they have just been in denial, and they haven't. And they also there is a slippery thing when you say extrajudicial killings, because uh, what is an extrajudicial killing? They keep on widening the definition of that from what uh, to say. Oh, to go along with what the U.S. says is necessary. You know, fear um, of the U.S. is stopping. Yeah, the there's a kind of um, international. Uh, what is it called? Um, uh, what is it called? Common law when it's developed. Uh, when I had it in my uh, 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 habitual common uh, a common law. Well, it, it, the Israelis said this at the beginning. They said uh, they were up against it, even against the U.S. when they started these targeted killings. But they were able to to work it. To, they said once something uh, a law is violated uh, consistently, then uh, that law goes out of practice. Okay. So the European Parliament has a similar makeup. Uh, there's more parties involved. The U.S. Uh, has uh, more drone bases in Germany than in any other uh, bases, and not just drone bases, than in any other country. Also has the most, uh, the most troops in Japan, but by far the most in Europe is Germany. This is from 2015. There's more there now. So it's strategically very important to the U.S. Germany. Not only is it morally most against, it's strategically the most important to keep them on board. Very important has been uh, the testimony of Brandon Bryant and other whistleblowers. But Brandon came and started talking to the German press 2013, 2014. And he went, it went before the Bundestag five hours testimony in an investigation about Rammstein there in 2015. This is what we learned from uh, Brandon and others that the, how it works for those who don't know. A Creech Air Base has a, a underground uh, a fiber optic cable to Rammstein, and Rammstein then sends a signal up to the uh, satellites, which then relay the signal down to the drones. Three seconds. Yeah, exactly. And or the other way around, the pictures are going the other way. 
So, um, and it's, not, it's also true that even though we know there's different uh, uh, drone bases around the U.S., and we see some South Dakota, California, N N Nevada, N North Dakota, Texas, etc., their, their signals are all going to preach. This is a Snowden document uh, that was uh, uh, published in the Intercept in 2015. Um, and, uh, and you see that then they, they all go from Creech to Rammstein, they all go from the Rammstein then to the satellite, and then they go to the drones that are near the areas of where they're being uh, deployed. It's furthermore a really small facility in Rammstein, the satellite relay station. It's just, uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, it's not going to even take jobs from the region, you know, it's not going to do anything if they try to stop it or control it. You know, so, um, and this is another thing that was done out of Romstein, which is, it, you, probably many of you know, the distributed common ground system. It has, uh, you know, based primarily in Langley, it has Beetle in it, it has uh, Hawaii in it, it has Korea, and for the other side of the world, that's in Romstein. That's more movable than this fiber optic tail. That's a group of people in the film. I have to move more quickly. Um, this is another important thing, Faisal bin Ali Yaber of Yemen is the only court case that's been taken anywhere uh, by a non-German citizen with the crime not in Germany, according to the German constitution, the German government must remedy this and this is still, in, in the case is still running. He, he, Faisal was kicked, was not heard at all in the U.S. Congress. And here's an example of another uh, initiative that we then did, um, Ray and I signed this code pink, others uh, and developed it, uh, Nick Modern, uh, a letter that went to Chancellor Merkel, and of course was sent to all in the Bundestag. So now, uh, as of 2015, started um, so large demonstrations at Rammstein around this issue that Germany should not allow the U.S. to do the drones from Rammstein. This demo was about 1,500, very positive press in the Stars and Stripes, and I did you say. I, I spoke at this, I was the only American to speak at this one. Um, and uh, then we had a larger one in 2016, over 5,000 came. Again, Stars and Strikes uh, reporting. Uh, Ray was interviewed by them, he spoke there. I also spoke uh, at that one. And uh, that's the largest demonstration that we know of that's been at any drone base uh, around the world, except in Pakistan, uh, where, they, uh, where it wasn't around drone bases, but where they actually stopped uh, tr uh, goods going to, uh, to uh, Afghanistan for the war. Um, and another important aspect for um, the, the U.S. role in, in Germany is um, that you probably know there's six commands worldwide. Originally, um, European Command had Africa within its mandate. 2008, the Bush administration said we want to do a lot more in Africa, which they certainly have since then. And they said we need our own military command, and they brought they asked at least uh, 12 and maybe 20, I forget the number, uh, you know, African countries to host it, and they would not, uh, none of them agreed to host it. So they secretly set it up in Stuttgart without asking the German parliament, without publicizing this. And, and so here is a little thing I just want to show quickly that shows, uh, it, it's said in German, but we're talking in English, the, um, um, wait a minute. Uh, that uh, first of all, it starts out with code pink. We were demonstrating from right. Africom, and then it goes on and shows a massive blockade of all four gates of Africom by musicians yeah. playing and well, so like classical music. Yeah, and and it was for four hours completely successful uh, in shutting down all the access to Africom. And by the way, one reason it went for four hours is that the German police. Oh, here you go. So we said we brought it, protested with them. Here you see uh, me delivering this letter and getting. Uh, I not only was arrested by the MP, I was, a, I was able to sue him in the German court for t putting the handcuffs on me. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, and the prosecutor took it on as a case, but I haven't heard much. And then came, comes here. Uh, 
they, you see that the German movement took up this banner that Code Pink made and gave them in their in that, that drones make enemies banner in this blockade. Um, and uh, they had a seven uh, seven miles traffic backup all the way down to central Stuttgart. And the press was extremely positive in the region, despite all that, in, in prime time press, positive about the blockade, despite the inconvenience, calling me the nice old uh, peace activist with 50 years experience who was very polite to the police when taken away. The police testified that way. They say, hey, we want, uh, you know, German, we have German districts in, and we want to be the guys in charge of these bases, ultimately. And the last thing you'll see, this one, the protest at, uh, that's going to come up, uh, the same group's going to protest again at uh, a German base in uh, northern Germany where uh, these Israeli drones would be directed from if they ever come through. And uh, they also, I'll just pass it around, used in their flyer this code pink banner that we brought over. I'm saying it, the, the influence is tremendous from the US peace movement. We need to do more. We need to reach out to other countries in Europe. And we should do it fast, because these drones are proliferating like mad. Can I show three last shots how quickly they're proliferating, uh, Ray? Just to show you how quickly they're proliferating the drones just very fast, not saying anything. Say again? Three last slides to show yeah. how quickly they're yeah, proliferating. Yeah, okay. So this is the countries, this is as of 2015, yeah. it's much worse now. The countries that have used drones for killing as of 2015 were these countries. Now, the countries that have weaponized drones as of 2015 were these countries. The countries that are developing weaponized drones are these countries. When we started this in 2013 and Code Pink went to the German parliamentarians and all, we were saying, take the leadership in stopping this. Unfortunately, the cat is pretty much out of the bag uh, since that time, actually. And, uh, and, and, and the fact is that uh, I read recently that Saudi Arabia bought the equivalent of a third of the U.S. drone arsenal from China recently, which is not known to have used these armed weapons itself. And the same is true with Russia, is not known to use it, but they all want to get on the international arms thing. And what the U.S. did is that they put in a, uh, they, they, they did start at the end of the o uh, Obama thing, on October 28, 2016, the State Department issued this this thing saying you can't export drones, the U.S. also not, to countries that it have a more, uh, you know, human rights abuse history or for uh, violating human rights. I mean, it's like the joke, the U.S. doing that. And the fact is uh, that Germany even signed on to this. But the fact is that Germany itself wanted to buy its drone from Israel because they, they, uh, they, they want to be able to, to control it if they do have it. Yeah, so. Okay, I'm okay. sorry. Uh, I'm so we want to do questions and answers. Thanks okay, very much, so Elsa. Wow. Um, <laughs> cats out of the bag. You're talking internationally. You're talking yeah. about, and that's our challenge, as I see it. You know, we can go as I have at Hancock and get get arrested with very imaginative. Oh, yeah. And I'll say one 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 thing about the imagination. You saw a little bit of that there, right? And, uh, not only that, but the you know fly fly kites and the drones. That kind of, <laughs> Well, uh, the Catholic worker up there in Ithaca and, uh, and Syracuse, New York, have a carpenter, and he's done incredible, what you call props or something for us, including drones shooting up to the sky like this, and Good Friday, we're hanging on the drones, okay? Three of us, right? Mm -hmm. wow. And uh, a little bit of symbolism there, okay? So, so the imagination is really important, but you know, all the progressives I know saw those, but none of my other friends. And that's, you know, I don't think this, the fault is in our stars, folks. The fault is in ourselves. I'm looking out here and I see really bright people. People who know other people. People who have contacts. God, we gotta get the stuff in the mass media. There's gotta be a way, okay? So that, that's, that's my little lab. And, and I, I can show you some stuff later about how we did Hancock. But that's on my website. You could see that at any time. Let's have questions now. There was how much does Israel play in the drone uh, sales and, and production? Yeah. You want well, Israel actually is the leading drone exporter. You know, of, 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 and um, 
And Israel and China also didn't sign this export agreement. So that means that uh, they will export to countries that the U.S. supposedly will not. The U.S. actually has only uh, provided weapons on their predators and reapers that they've sold in, they sold them in Great Britain, Italy, France, Holland, and um, uh, I think and maybe Spain. But they have the only, uh, after a five year struggle in the U.S. Congress, Italy got some weapons for their droves. They gave them right away to the to, the, to the Great Britain, of course, uh, and they even had the the British drone pilots sitting in Creech from 2008 when they first gave them till till they could were allowed to be on a base in, in uh, whatever. I'm just saying, okay. So right here. Yeah. But if you uh, that that will change though. If uh, there's a very good article uh, from July 30th in the Intercept from Zai Jilani about uh, missile, right now, drones are covered under the Missile Control Act, and there's a very good article uh, about how hacked emails showed how the United Arab Emirates gave $250,000 to the Center for New America Security, which is run by Michelle Flournoy, who would have been Hillary Clinton's <laughs> defense secretary. She was the Under Secretary for Policy, under Barack Obama, and Florinoy had her people write up a document on why we need to change our Missile Patrol Act to allow places like the UAE to have weaponized drones. So, and it all comes down to money. Because then basically, if you see the public version of this report, this $250,000 bribe, basically, it comes down to just exactly what Elsa was saying, is that the Chinese are selling them, the Israelis are selling them, we should be able to sell them. We're missing out, you know? So it will change shortly. I imagine Americans will start selling them too. Yes, please. Um, I was just curious with the focus on weaponized drones. In Vermont, when we did some organizing around drones, we just said we wanted to, to oppose drones, period because even the non-weaponized ones, they kind of just legitimize the presence of drones as something that exists. But I wonder, because it seemed like consistently it was addressing weaponized drones, or is there more of a question about drones, period? Well, you know, people talk about delivering the mail with drones and going into disaster areas with drones. So, I, you know, my own civilian kind of uneducated response is that that cat is out of the bag that drones will be used for these UPS and Amazon <laughs> deliveries and so forth. Yeah, but just, using so what we need to do is take focus in on them. Is that your, your well, No, I was going to say, though, that, that our protest and uh, that, uh, that Global Action Day, I mean, Nick Moder is very against su surveillance also. Our, the, the actual slogan was against the use of uh, drones for surveillance and killing. And so that was what Code Pink actually presented internationally, and that was taken up at that time, 2013, 2014. But I Against surveillance yeah. and killing. Yeah. Yeah. And I just yeah. want to say one other little detail in the German thing, in case you run into it. The U.S. firm uh, 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 that produces the Reapers and the Predators uh, is, has had a long court case in the German thing, saying in the German courts, uh, the, saying that the bidding process wasn't fair and that Germany has to buy U.S. drones. <laughs> so. I, I will say, though, that we have to be proactive on that, too, though, that we, on the surveillance aspects, because what they will claim is that this, the drones are different than other forms of surveillance, as they already claim that overflight is different than looking into your window, which mm -hmm. is what the police agencies claim. Okay, mm -hmm. and the same way that they claim that email is different than opening up your letters, mm -hmm. which is what they've tried to do with the domestic surveillance, with your mass surveillance, with your spying on your computer, it's different than an envelope, which is complete, you know, I mean, but that's what they're going to say, is that overflight is different than looking at your window. Yeah. Yeah. And the sensors available today can see through your roof, you know, yeah, you know see through your roof. Yeah, 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 exactly. So please. Ray, back to the ultimate beginning of your talk, why do you think the Council of Churches, be it different faiths, have been so silent on the moral and ethical issues of drones. We cannot depend on the people that you would normally refer to <coughs> as the moral leadership of this country or any other. You cannot depend on the institutional church, synagogue, or even mosque to lead this battle. 
That's bad news in one sense, but that puts the burden squarely on our shoulders. They're not going to do it. They didn't do it in the 30s in Germany. You know, the Catholic and the Lutheran churches couldn't find their voices. And it's very similar now. And when, when someone like the Presbyterians, they have something called a stated clerk, right? And he's sort of like the pope between big sessions, okay? And he came out with a statement and was great. He said, you know, condemn torture, up and down, why it's wrong morally and everything else, okay? So here I am speaking in Dallas <laughs> at a Presbyterian church. And finally I have something positive to say. I said, I can't, I can't tell you how much I appreciated your, your, your statement, your strong statement against torture. I looked down at those 50 faces and, and I said, oh, you know about the state of clerks? <laughs> I didn't know, and then I shouldn't have done this, but I, I turned to the minister and I said, surely you know, and I said, no, don't tell you. So, even, so even when there's a high kind of thing, you know, uh, if, unless it's preached from the pulpit, and if you do that, of course, the, the collection is not going to be as big. One last thing here on this. Um, Albert Camus, the French philosopher, was invited by a Dominican monastery after World War II to tell him what he thought about the role of the church during World War II. And you know what he said? He said, this will surprise you because I'm an agnostic, but I kept waiting for a voice out of Rome. We all were waiting for a voice out of Rome. And they said, well, why is that? He said, well, that was the established thing we looked for, for religious and moral leadership. He said, I was later told, and this is interesting, I was later told that the voice did come from Rome, but it was in the form of an encyclical. And so I asked, what the hell is an encyclical? <laughs> so whose fault is it that the voice was not heard? Now, last thing, of course, is here's Pope Francis. Good guy, right? Goes before Congress and he says, the main problem is the blood-drenched arms traders. He said that. He said that before Congress. So, here comes the, the and they, oh, they all got up, you know, and they didn't apply like this. Then they looked in their pocket to make sure that the latest uh, envelope from Lockheed was, was still there. Right? <laughs> ah! Okay, so here's Pope Francis receiving the commander-in-chief of the blood-soaked arms traders, our president, after he signed a $110 billion deal with the Saudis to give them arms, right? To sell them arms, okay? So here comes, here comes Trump, and here's the Pope. I'm saying, oh man, this is great! You know, this is his chance! He doesn't have to do an encyclical. No, just, just tell him off in front of all the press, you know? And what does the Pope do? Very courageous. He didn't smile for the first five photos. <laughs> wow! And some of my Catholic friends said, wasn't that great how the Pope didn't smile? He didn't say diddly. What did he do? He gave him an encyclical. An encyclical about the Umwelt, the uh, environment, right? Which is good, but, you know, he muffed it. So, what, I mean, this is a long-winded way of saying, those of us who belong to faith communities don't think we can fall back and rely on our leadership. We got to do it all by ourselves. And maybe that's a good thing in the long run. Yeah, uh, please. What do you know about the status of, I don't know if they're called autonomous drones, with the algorithm that they can, the drone itself can fire without human input? Is that coming soon? It, it, as far as I know, it exists. It's there already. We, we, we can, uh, Kim, we can, we can have the car come and drive us. A, a car can come and drive. Hey, a beer truck, a year and a half ago, a beer truck uh, in Colorado uh, had a, a, the, the robot took the beer out of the cooler, put the beer in the truck. The truck drove itself 150 miles. A robot offloaded the beer out of the truck into a cooler all by itself. Uh, the autonomous capabilities are all there. The ability for a drone to uh, be fed targets or be told what to look for, um, have, a, have the sensors find that person. I'm, I apologize for saying target rather than person. Uh, I'm trying to get myself out of that habit. 
Um, find the person it's looking for. Uh, the person in the black shirt with the VFP uh, helmet with the British, you know, uh, that type of thing, right? I mean, find that person and then kill that person. Um, that's there. For that, you know, I mean, I mean, the, maybe the drone might need some help getting out of the hangar, maybe the drone might need some help being fueled maintenance-wise, but in, term for, in terms of the drone taxiing, taking off, Finding the person and killing the person, that that technology is all available. That software is all available. Those sensors are all available. That's all there. Mm -hmm. it, 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 you know, I mean, Tesla, have you all seen it's, it's wicked cool. Have you ever seen the, the you know, you, you, you have the, you buy your, the, the Tesla automobile, you pull into the garage and the, the snake, the electrical cord comes out of the wall and hooks up and, you, you know, hook, I mean, like all this stuff is there. All the autonomous stuff is there already. And so certainly it's there for us to kill people with our flying robots halfway around the world. Now, whether or not it's people who we intend to kill, or it's just ground people who happen to meet the parameters that are, if we have coded into the software, the algorithm, you know? I mean, that's one thing Ray and I were talking about earlier. I mean, these missiles, these Hellfire missiles and everything else in the bomb, I mean, they are very, very accurate. They, that, that's one thing I think people misunderstand. The Hellfire is an incredibly accurate missile. It will go through the rear windshield of that car that you want it to go through. The reason why we kill all the wrong people and I, we, we, is because we don't know who we're trying to kill. We don't really kill, and part of it is we don't even care who we're trying to kill. We're just trying to kill people. We just want to kill. To make it's, money. To make money, it's because of power, because we're, Crazed because we're in the war spirit, because of all these different reasons. I don't, I, I don't happen to assign one reason uh, over another. I think there are some. There certainly money is a big, big factor. I mean, I know what is tradition. Yeah. And tradition. We, we I mean, doing it for two hundred or three hundred. Exactly. Years. I mean, we don't want to lose. Yeah, we, we could be here all. I think there's probably another session on this at some point. <laughs> today. But, but yeah, exactly. Yeah. Question here. Yeah, yeah please. Yeah, I have a question for Matt because he's been in the drone program and well, around it, yeah. Around it. yeah. Uh, I've been at Veal and Creech for the last five years. Every time there's a protest, ah, good and, and then I've talked to Heather Levinbaugh and Lisa Lynn. They don't like our protesting at the air bases. They think you're only talking to the underlings that are the poor people in the military. Mm -hmm and you're upsetting them, but you're not doing any good with the superiors in the, at the base. And so they're upset by it. And when we do block, the, the, the military people get upset too. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not getting the message that we want to give to them, I don't think. And I'm yeah. just wondering what your thoughts are on that. I, I think we have to appeal to the consciences of the people in the drone program. We have to try and separate as many people from the drone program as possible to reach out to them um, morally and compassionately, uh, not put a wedge between ourselves and them, but uh, to, uh, try and gather them to us and do it as compassionately as possible. But use that gathering, try and bring them to us in order to destroy the drone program. Um, I think it's such a small enough program and such a close-knit program and a program that is built upon immorality and illegality that just a small number of defections from the program will devastate the program. Look, I, I'm a big believer that the GI resistance was one of the ultimate reasons for the destruction of the Vietnam uh, was one of the reasons for us getting out of the Vietnam War. I mean, the ultimate reason, of course, being the, the Vietnamese people themselves, right? I mean, uh, I don't want to take away from, from you know, what they did. But, um, and what was the cause of that? That was the enlisted service member in Vietnam. That wasn't the majors and the colonels and the generals. They were draftees. Yeah, right, I mean, like that was the, and so it's talking to the young men and women who are like Heather and like Lisa. You know, particularly, I know Heather's story I know from the National Bird movie, right? I mean, like, um, and if you all haven't seen National Bird, please watch it. Now, I, what I love about National Bird so much is what Sonia did with that film was she didn't just talk about kind of like what, what Elsa did here today. It was like we could have had a panel where you had three 
dudes like me just tell you about how bad stuff is. But what, what Elsa did was she put together this panel and you had a guy like me tell you how bad things are, but then Elsa told you what someone did about it, right? And like in what Sonia's case with National Bird, what she did was she, she told you about how bad, how awful the drone program is, but then she told you the story of three people who did something about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I mean, I think that's what it is. But in the case of talking to these, I think what we need to do is, and what I've been saying to some of the folks who've been involved in these movements is that one of the issues with our activities against the drone program is that we are limited on our resources. And we've got some incredible people doing it really heartfelt, really great work, but we are spread out around the country and our resources are limited and we need to combine our resources. We need to better effectively utilize our resources because we are spread so thin against this massive Leviathan. So we need to kind of basically bring our resources together, unify our effort in order to have a greater impact, right? Um, but in terms of reaching out to the service members, we need to do so compassionately, understanding what they're going through, and understanding that no one ever separates from service. I mean, none of us join VFP on one decision, right? Did anyone here all of a sudden just wake up one day and be like, I'm joining VFP today. I'm totally against this stuff. I mean, like, I've just made up my mind. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure all of us kind of went through a long process of it, right? So I think, like, I think with the, the, the folks in the drone, and also, too, with the drone program, these guys are under such um, fear, and they're, they're, they will be thrown in jail, and if you talk to anybody, you, you know what I mean, like, you will be, you know, sent to Leavenworth for life, and this is such a classified program, and I, I believe a lot of them are made to sign NDAs, which, you know, I mean, the non-disclosure agreements, so I think we have to understand that, too, uh, in how they're being dealt with. Yeah, I'd like just to, just to add that uh, I think we have to do both. Uh, what Matt was just saying, we also have to be appearing at the recruiting centers. I mean, these these poor young people with no prospects, economic or educational, they're at the recruiting center. So we need to, to prevent at the source this stuff from coming. So as long as we're doing both, it seems to me, and as long as uh, it, there's still consciences involved here, like, you know, before algorithms take over completely, <laughs> yeah. uh, killed by algorithm, well, you know, uh, doesn't, you know, doesn't, it's not less pain, painful. So it seems to me that we have a window here. And, and the uh, schools are a great opening. Schools too, yeah. School. So we need to appeal to consciences while consciences still have a role in this sort of stuff. And I appreciate, I've talked with Lisa at, at length, uh, and I appreciate how she feels, and I can see the perspective she brings to it. But we're not trying to shame anybody. No, that should be the very last thing. Yeah, we're trying to conscientiousize or make conscious what's going on. I yeah. think that's legit.